The movie opens up with a guy named Callum Aldrich, who is in the middle of his cleaning shift at an office. During this, he receives a call from an unknown person who blackmails him into coming to a specified location within 15 minutes, or else he'll leak Callum's private screenshots to his friends and family. And Callum's been screenshot in naked dogs. Feeling helpless, Callum rushes to the said location, only to stumble upon a crash site where the driver is lying on the ground, while the passenger appears helpless inside the vehicle. Overwhelmed with panic. Callum calls 911 to report the situation. Moments later, the driver, who is pretending to be dead, suddenly wakes up and incapacitates Callum from behind before abducting him. This sounds like a job for the sexiest man alive. The following morning, the police arrive at the scene with Chief Inspector John Luther leading the case. Luther's colleague, Martin, briefs him that the passenger in the car is Sari Jones, who disappeared seven years ago. After scrutinizing the crime scene details, Luther deduces that Callum wasn't just caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, but someone had intended to abduct him. He then reaches out to Callum's mother, Corinne, and promises to find her son. Luther has seen at least a hundred people die. He probably shouldn't have promised that. Amidst the bystanders, there's a man named David Roby, seemingly concerned by Luther's involvement in the case. He is revealed to be the culprit behind the abductions. Knowing that Luther will be a huge obstacle in his plan, David and his absurd haircut dig up dirt on the various illegal acts Luther has committed as a police officer, aiming to wipe him off the case. A few days later, Luther is dragged into court, facing a multitude of charges, including intimidation of suspects, evidence of tampering, and bribery. As a consequence of these unlawful deeds, he is imprisoned in Hawksmoor Maximum Security Prison. This news excites David, as he can now proceed with his plans without any interference, and it was so much easier than it should have been. David turns out to be a wealthy trader and serial killer, who blackmails people for their dark secrets. In the prison, the inmates hate Luther as several Several of them are incarcerated because of him, hence they often form alliances and beat him up. The movie then cuts to a few years later. One day, Corinne receives a call in which she hears her son crying. She tries to talk to him, but before that, she has provided a location to meet him. Without thinking twice, Corinne drives to the location, which is an empty house. Upon entering, she calls out for her son and soon comes across a horrifying scene. Lifeless bodies suspended from the ceiling, including Callum's. Soon, parents of other victims also arrive, and it appears that everything has been planned. Just then, the room is set on fire, during which Corinne spots a masked man staring at her from the window. She then runs away in the nick of time, but unfortunately, the other parents are not so lucky. The next day, police arrive at the scene, and DCI Odette Rain is now leading the case. After a swift examination of the house, Rain holds a meeting with her team and outlines that the earliest murder dates back 11 years, with the most recent being from the previous year. She speculates that the acts were carefully planned and carried out over an extended period of time. So, there will be a lot of data to parse. She then assigns the team to find out a commonality between all the murders, which will take them closer to the killer. Meanwhile, within the confines of the prison, Luther receives an envelope that is written 65.8 on it. He understands it to be a radio frequency, because what the hell else would it be? And upon tuning in, here's a recording of Callum's anguished voice, recorded just before his death. The recording also features the voice of David, who admits that he is the one to put him in jail and challenges Luther to stop him if he can. Afterwards, Corinne visits Luther in jail and berates him for not finding her son's killer. Luther tries to talk to her, but she isn't ready to listen. After a brief conversation, Corinne leaves, and as she gets into a car, we learn that David is the one who brought her there. He is pretending to console her in every way he can. How'd they become friends? I don't know. Who cares? Later on, Luther uses his hidden cell phone to inform Rain of the broadcast, but she refuses to accept any help from a criminal. In addition, she directs her subordinate, Archie, to get Luther's phone confiscated. Left with no other options, Luther contacts his former colleague, Dennis, to help him break out of the prison. But before they can delve further into the plan, the prison officers confiscate his phone. Later, Luther also liaises with the prison guards to get himself transferred to another prison with lower level security. The guards refuse, saying that they can't change the system. Hearing this, Luther devises a plan to have the inmates attack him, which will ultimately result in the system relocating him. Not sure how that that works or why he waited two years to do it, but let's just watch him punch some large men. That same night, one of the prisoners attempts to commit the unthinkable, attracting the attention of the control room officers. They somehow manage to save the prisoner, but out of the blue, he knocks them out and escapes with the key. Was the guy faking it? Were the police officers in on it? What the hell is going on? The prisoner then unlocks all the cells, initiating chaos. Following this, many inmates gang up on Luther and dish out a brutal punishment on him. When the guards see this, they eventually decide to transfer him, just as he planned. 
hand. Later, Luther is being driven to another prison when a black van intervenes. It's Dennis and his men who incapacitate the officers and rescue Luther from captivity. They then drop him off at a garage, and Luther pays them for their work. Now that he's freed from confinement, Luther vows to capture the serial killer. On the other hand, Rain learns about Luther's escape, so she summons the retired officer Martin for help, since no one knows Luther better than him. Martin agrees to help and goes to the prison to check Luther's belongings. He finds the radio frequency and deduces that Luther's location can be traced by tracking the frequency back to its source. Meanwhile, Luther arrives at the site of the broadcast and meets a tattoo artist named Derek. He demands to know who used his radio frequency, but Derek and his absurd haircut are initially hesitant to divulge any information. However, after a little intimidation, Derek confesses that he was blackmailed by a man for some of his private videos. According to Derek, he received the transmitter through a courier and was instructed to leave it running for 24 hours before ditching it somewhere. Derek also provides Luther with a cell phone through which the blackmailer contacts him. With this information, Luther grabs the cell phone and leaves just before the police arrive. Elsewhere, we see a group of David's workers who are keeping an eye on people from all over the world. They have seemingly hacked into phones, cameras, tablets, and home security cameras, enabling them to spy on people. In this way, David retrieves their confidential activities, which he gets a bunch of secretaries to punch into Excel spreadsheets, and then he exploits for blackmail, compelling them to carry out his bidding. In the next scene, Luther contacts Martin, seeking help in tracing a phone number. The latter reluctantly agrees and informs him of the location of Piccadilly Circus. After this, Martin also relays the information to Rain, who then deploys armed police, SCO-19, to apprehend Luther and the serial killer. Upon arriving at the location, Luther dials the number from Derek's cell phone, and David, who happens to be there, receives it. This allows Luther to spot him. Trapped and left with no options, David immediately grabs a kid from the crowd and holds him at knife point with a sinister smile. He declares that, This is just the beginning, precious. Actually, it's about the halfway point, Sneagle. The next second, several of his blackmailed victims begin jumping off from a nearby building, one after another, creating chaos. David seizes this as the perfect opportunity and runs towards the subway. Luther pursues him, but he is also chased by the police officers. At one point, Luther catches up to David, which results in a physical altercation between them. Our hero eventually gains the upper hand, pinning David down, but the fight is soon interrupted by a police officer. Luther urges him to cuff David first, but the officer strikes him to the ground. This enables David to stab the officer and flee. Luther then applies first aid to the officer's wound before making his own escape. In the aftermath, David calls his inside man Archie, questioning why he didn't inform him about Luther's escape from prison. When the latter fails to give a response, David threatens to leak his confidential videos. He then calls one of his men named Kachimov and asks about their plan's progress. In response, Kachimov shows him video footage of a group of teenagers whom he has captured. On the other hand, Luther contacts Martin and asks him to activate speakerphone mode. He then shares his insights about the commonality they've been seeking. According to Luther, David is blackmailing people by recording their private videos and killing them. He also asserts that nowadays, the fear of shame and being caught is way more powerful than the fear of death. That's right, Luther just guessed all that shit. Amidst this conversation, Rain traces Luther's location and dispatches a group of officers to apprehend him. However, Luther senses this, so he destroys his phone and flees the area. That same night, Rain calls her daughter, Anya, to tell her to sleep on time because she won't be home due to her busy work. Since the girl is alone, it becomes easy for David to break into the house and kidnap her. At the same time, Luther visits Corinne to gather additional insights about the killer. He believes that the murderer knew some secret about Callum, which is why he went to see him. Assuming that Corinne might have knowledge of the killer, Luther inquires if anyone knew has come into her life since Callum's death. In response, she tells him about a certain Tommy, whom she met at a support group. Here, it is revealed that Tommy is none other than David. At the police headquarters, Martin highlights a pattern wherein at least five families have been approached by a man in his 40s over recent years. The names vary, but the descriptions share a common likeness. On checking their database, Rain finds out David's name. But before she can provide this information to her team, David contacts her, telling her about Anya. He then proposes a deal. He'll release the little girl if she brings Luther to him. Following this, Rain reaches out to Luther, arranging a meeting at a restaurant. As they meet, she cleverly subdues him and 
prepares to take him away. But Luther isn't going to give up so easily. She tries to put him in the trunk, but he's just simply too big. He convinces her to work together by mentioning that there are several kids like Anya locked up right now, and if they don't act, they will be killed. After this, the two dig up information on David and find about his ex-wife, Georgette. Apparently, she cheated on him with some other guy, and as a punishment, he burnt her face. Now, she is confined to a wheelchair, unable to move properly. She also looks really scary. Rain and Luther visit Georgette at her house and request for her help in catching David. At first, she hesitates, fearing the consequences of revealing information. However, upon learning about the predicament of Rain's daughter, she reveals that David owns property abroad in Norway. With this newfound lead, Luther and Rain decide to travel to Norway in order to rescue the captives. Before leaving, though, Luther calls Martin, seeking one last favor. Later on, Archie learns about Rain's departure and relays the information to David. Hearing this, David understands Georgette's betrayal and blackmails Archie to execute her. With no other choice, Archie sneaks into Georgette's place, but just before injecting her with a lethal drug, he is intercepted by Martin and other police officers. It's the same favor Luther asked earlier, as he knew that David would try to harm her. Archie, who isn't ready to turn himself in, administers the drug to his own ass. In the next scene, Luther and Rain finally arrive at David's mansion in Norway, which is covered in snow. Upon entering, they come across a series of mannequins and a girl suspended from the ceiling. Believing that it's Anya, Rain breaks down in tears and directs her anger towards Luther. She says, it should be you up there, which is absurd because it's her fault that the bad guy got away earlier. She also shouts at him to leave her alone. Complying, Luther exits the room and makes his way out to a secret underground bunker. Not long after, Rain realizes that the suspended body doesn't belong to Anya. Borderline unbelievable that she didn't notice this immediately. But before she can return to Luther, she's ambushed by Kachimov. Got a Kachimov. Back in the basement, David attacks Luther and restrains him with a chain. After a while, he starts a live stream titled The Red Bunker, where he subjects kidnapped victims to fatal torment. This live stream is watched by his followers, who derive enjoyment from the gruesome scenes and vote on what will happen to the victims. David announces that he has a surprise opening act for his followers, and it's not just his dumbass turtleneck. He introduces Luther as a special guest. Shortly after, Rain is also brought into the bunker, where Anya is held hostage. David then tries to force the detectives to hurt each other. However, at one point, Luther addresses the live audience, revealing that the police are tracking them all with their IP addresses and are on the way here. This prompts the followers to exit the live stream out of fear, enraging David. As a result, he leaves the room and locks the door using his phone. Reacting quickly, Luther takes down a guard, frees Rain, and makes his way out of the room just before the door seals shut. This leaves Rain, Anya, and Kachimov trapped inside. Soon after, the kerosene spray activates, foreshadowing an imminent fire. Rain implores Kachimov to unlock the door, but the latter instead launches an attack on her. A fierce fight ensues between them, but despite being physically outmatched, Rain somehow manages to incapacitate her opponents. Somehow, indeed, that punch looked soft. Meanwhile, David attempts to flee in his jeep, but Luther manages to board the vehicle too. An intense fight ensues between the two, while the jeep off-roads like a badass hell yeah by a jeep. But it ultimately crashes into a frozen lake. David tries to swim out, but he's trapped inside the ice and dies. Luther succeeds in unlocking the bunker door using David's phone, thereby rescuing Rain and Anya. But by this time, Luther's own breath starts to wane. He is about to pass out, but the police divers show up in the nick of time. That's right, in the three minutes since the jeep hit the water, they showed up and put on full scuba gear and they get Luther out. In the aftermath of these events, Luther is rushed to the hospital back in London. The news of the serial killer's death is also on television, which brings a sense of contentment to Corinne. In the final scene, Luther is approached by a senior official who offers him a job at the police department. 